Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me. I'm, as usual, out walking in uh, the botanical gardens this afternoon, saying hello to many plants and animals that I love, and some of whom I have a close relationship with. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about that is that the news gets around in a way us moderns might find surprising. So that, for example, if, if I am close with an animal, if I have a relationship with an animal or a plant or a tree, it's like I'm participating in a non-ordinary network that is certainly invisible to conceptual thought. And perhaps that's part of what I mean when I use this word non-ordinary. I don't actually mean, or the phrase, conjunction, however you want to call it. I, I don't actually mean, um, well, I guess I have different meanings in different contexts, which is how I try to use words and how I try to think about both the flexibility and dangers of language. Um, but I don't really mean uh, supernatural or metaphysical, although nor do I not mean those things. It's just that that's not what I'm emphasizing. When I'm using the word now or the phrase now, what I mean is unlike our common ideas. And that is also a kind of a strange thing because there are many, many human beings who are aware of the intimacies, the faculties, the relationships, the gifts uh, with well within the reach of our common humanity, and many people practice these intimacies in their own sometimes unique and sometimes common ways. But when I know an animal or a plant in a living place, the funny thing about it is that word gets around, <laughs> and that language might be a bit conflicted because it's not words that get around. But something like the news travels. Other creatures become aware that I respect and adore the living beings and that I have a practice of relating with love and attentiveness and presence with them. And so, for example, if I make a friend of... <laughs> relatively easy friends to make, usually, but... If I make a friend of a blue jay, this will change my relationship with all the local birds. And it will also change my relationship with the trees and the plants and the animals. Um, and if I make a, a friend of a raccoon or an opossum or a skunk, something very similar happens. The news travels. And I don't think it travels by talking. And without being able to describe or explain the living network in which this news travels, I'm deeply aware of it, respectful and reverent about it, and unlikely to dismiss it with low-hanging clinical explanations of things like, well, of course, if you feed an animal, other animals see this, right? But the, the relationships are actually quite complex because, for example, when I first began to relate with uh, some jays that I love, who know me well now, 
I used to put some food in a specific spot in the garden. And <laughs> because I was so focused on the Jays, I wasn't paying attention to the fact that the hummingbirds nearby were quite upset about this. Um, because, well, <laughs> in a complex way. The simple explanatory framework is that the hummingbirds have a very intimate relationship with the blue jays, and it's not merely enmity, but they're aware that the blue jays pose a threat to their young. Um, because the blue jays will eat hummingbird eggs. And so will uh, crows, magpies, other corvids, um, perhaps some hawks, though unlikely. <clears throat> Turns out that the hummingbirds that nest near hawk nests have a fledge rate of about something around 80% according to literature. And those that don't have a fledging rate, successful fledge rate of something around 15 or 20 percent. And this is, of course, because the corvids, well, <laughs> again, the actual, what's actually going on is really, really complex and not like our explanatory paradigms. And I think it's important to highlight this so that we don't forget. Because once, we have an ex once I have an explanation or a model, it's really easy to believe it and to think that it's sufficient um, or that I know what's going on. I've learned to resist that, that urge over time and it requires practice for most of us. Uh, it appears that the corvids don't want to approach the nest sites of hawks which can prey on them directly, not merely on their young. Um, so there's a very complex web, and in the beginning, while I wasn't paying attention to the hummingbirds, um, and, and they would be very vocal, uh, but it took me a while before I got the message, you know. They're very vocally telling me, hey, our nest is near here. Um, it's not we're not happy and, and it's a problem for us if you keep bringing the uh, the blue jays toward our nest so eventually I learned um, to pay attention to that and then the hummingbirds relaxed uh, but for a while they weren't too happy about me so the news travels in different ways and <laughs> there's so many different features of this situation on my mind <laughs> that I'm going to have to take a few moments to organize my, my path. One of the simpler things I can say is that the internet, as we understand it with humans, which I think we rather poorly understand it actually, um, rather than us having an internet, and much like many of our other technological innovations, our tools seem to possess us. This is a very strange situation. You can imagine how confused you'd be for more reasons than one if you saw a car riding a human down the street. But this is something like, this, this trope resembles our situation. We think we're riding our technologies, but they are riding us. And they're extremely expensive in ways we have no systems of accounting for. But the internet is a derivative of something accessible to us in relationships with living beings, places, and each other. Also with origin and knowledge. And perhaps 
the most peculiar technology of all, language. The technology with which we structure memory and preserve it over time, preserve those structures over time, exchange them, um, place them in competition not only with each other, but with ourselves and perhaps even with life on earth. I was just listening again to my dear friend Ryan First Diver to his, his phenological lecture on the current moon cycle, Gatoi. And Ryan is one of the unusual people in my world who's deeply aware um, of much of what I speak of and am concerned about and has been a wonderful ally and teacher and companion in my own path of learning, which for me sometimes seems to go far too, far more slowly than I would prefer. <laughs> and to proceed by millimeters rather than inches or feet or miles. Though there are occasional sudden leaps. And Ryan uh, along with being just a brilliant human being. He's an embodiment of lineage knowledge that has been preserved and transferred within Blackfoot communities, perhaps for thousands of years. What an incredibly rare gift it is to have a friend like this, particularly in our modern time when the originally indigenous peoples and their languages uh, are disappearing and undergoing sort of wave after wave of what we might refer to as colonization. I guess when we use this word, we often think of, you know, the... Uh, the peculiar disjunction between nomadic peoples who live on the land, and of course not all of the peoples who live on the land are nomadic because um, the necessity of moving about depends very deeply on the transformations of living places over lunar and so solar cycles and perhaps cycles we have no no idea or concept for. <clears throat> um, and so there are, there are settled indigenous peoples and there are still some nomadic indigenous peoples. Um, but when we use this word colonization, I think we think of uh, the stories surrounding the histories and tragedies surrounding uh, the invasion of territories by city builders um, and Western, largely Western colonial powers. But it's also useful to think about it in the same way we might think about the colonization the idea of colonization that we might get from infection, right? Um, with certain forms of bacteria or viruses uh, that colonize us and live in and as and with our bodies, um, sometimes neutrally, sometimes beneficially, and sometimes catastrophically.
And one of the things I like about Ryan is that he's uh, surprisingly humble um, about the his role yeah, as a someone who is embodying and preserving and nurturing and sharing from these ancient traditions. You can find his wide range of lectures on YouTube if you search for Ryan First Diver, two words. And particularly if you add to that phenology that's P H E N O L O G Y. <clears throat> then you can find his phonology lectures, which are, <laughs> in my perspective, one of the most valuable and astonishing things available on the internet. And this is in my mind today, not merely because I was listening to his lectures but because of an experience I had last night that brings full circle something precious to me. Before I'd been introduced to the idea of phonology, and I want to be clear there's something much deeper here than any kind of study can reveal, vastly more deep and more accessible and differently accessible, accessible to our interiority, to our essence, to our souls, to our hearts, to the origins within time and embodiment of our minds. There's something much, much deeper than any kind of study will reveal, and it's this asset that is precious to me. Though I value also the uh, study and intellectual knowledge. So, <clears throat> before I knew that phonology existed, before I knew that there were people who studied living time over cycles of the sun and moon, but since the moon has a faster pulse, it's more, the moon cycles have a faster pulse, they're more accessible to us, right? Um, in the West, we have this idea of seasons, uh, and we ordinarily count them as four. Uh, winter, spring, summer, fall, and we see this as a circle or cycle. But each year there are 12 or perhaps 13, depending on the specific circumstances in the living places, there are 12 or 13 moons. And although there were solar societies, probably throughout history, societies that marked time by the sun, um, most of the ancient and indigenous societies that I've become aware of uh, pay very close attention to the moon. <clears throat> so that it becomes a, a demarcation, right, each moon cycle from the new moon to the new moon or from the first crescent to the last crescent or the next first crescent. Um, the time when the moon is gone is a very important mysterious situation and of course there are wonderful ancient stories, um, origin stories, and teaching stories, and magical stories, mythos stories, around 
uh, the origin of humans and their relationships with the sun and the moon and the morning star and what is sometimes referred to as the false morning star and also with the dipper stars and the Pleiades stars. But these are rarely presented as objects. In fact, I've never heard it done. <laughs> um, they're presented as beings of a non-ordinary whose scope of existence is very different from those of us who are merely embodied. So, long ago, when I first came here <clears throat> to San Francisco, I looked around for signs of life, and I'm particularly fascinated by specific forms, though I love all the forms, pretty much without exception. Uh, I'm not super happy about things like, you know, fleas or mosquitoes or something, but I still love them. Um, <clears throat> so when I first came here, uh, I was new to this living place and I really saw it as a city and not a living place. And I saw the park and the garden as human invented representations of living places. Um, and that was a bit naive. Over time, I came to understand that anywhere there's life is a living place, even if there's a difference in the accessible depth and diversity of a wilderness and the accessible depth and diversity of a backyard or even the little square of cement that has been cut away in front of a house in order for some plants to be growing there. <laughs> and one night, well, because when I came here I was very curious, I started to look around for the forms of life I remember from my childhood. And I have to tell you, it's important to understand that in the 60s and 70s, there were vastly more forms of life all around every place I lived, even in the cities I lived. They were mostly small cities. Uh, unfortunately, over a very short period of time, most of that life disappeared. All kinds of insect species disappeared. Bird species disappeared. Amphibians are among the first to go. Um, when there's an environmental problem because they're very delicate. And so the species of frogs and toads and salamanders and newts, uh, lizards and snakes that I had occasionally or sometimes regularly encountered in my childhood, these became very rare as I got older. And this was due primarily to environmental toxicification of, of, a, of a wide range of kinds but one of the most devastating of all was the widespread use of DDT uh, as an insecticide in the 60s and 70s, if I remember correctly, certainly in the 70s. When, and Rachel Carson, of course, wrote her brilliant book, Silent Spring, about this problem. <clears throat> and I consider that to have been an act of heroism. But as I got older, the creatures I adored largely disappeared. All kinds of different spiders and insects, beetles, and moths, butterflies, dragonflies, uh, they went away and they didn't come back. And when I came here, I thought the gardens here and the park would be a perfect place to find some amphibians, and perhaps some reptiles. But I was mistaken. I've turned over hundreds of logs and pieces of wood in the gardens and in the, in the park, and I've never yet seen one frog 
or amphibian. Not one salamander, not one newt. In fact, peculiarly, um, Golden Gate Park is built on what used to be sand dunes. And these days, when one turns the log over, although <laughs> it may be different today than it was back then, I'll try it. Let's have a peek. Very little. Some spiders. But one of the surprising things is that under the loam in the gardens, even though we're three or four miles from the ocean. There are thousands of sand fleas. And these are the detritivores um, that are native to this area. And I think it's hard to outcompete them. They're staggeringly numerous. Um, and you find them wherever you lift up some of the loam. This is uncommon. Ordinarily, these creatures aren't found more than a mile or two from the ocean. <clears throat> but perhaps some 25 years ago, I was out walking in the evening. And as I recall, it was a full moon. Now, of course, in Western culture, we think of this as one specific moment in the time of one day in the cycle. But indigenous cultures weren't so concerned about exactitude in numerism, at least when thinking about the moon cycle, so that for the three days around the new moon, uh, it may be understood to be the new moon, and the full moon might be on a specific day, but also for a few days around it, right, it's still relatively full. So one night I was out walking, and I'd looked everywhere I could think of, and found no evidence of amphibians here. Um, there used to be a little exception, I'm not sure if it will survive, here in the gardens there is one specific pond where there were unusual frogs. But I think during the pandemic that man-made pond wasn't continuously filled and one of the important reproductive cycles may have been um, overcome right, by the lack of water so that the eggs did not survive. We will find out this spring. Uh, <laughs> and of course, the, um, the indigenous peoples who follow the moon, they have something more like 12 or 13 seasons, and they don't tend to think of spring and fall, though there may be exceptions. Mm. Sorry, 12 or 13 seasons the moon seasons. And phenology is, in part, the study of the transformations that are available both to our, to our perception, both um, somewhat objectively, right, in the sense of, ah, oh, these birds have just returned from far away, or these animals are now making nests, or these insects or animals or plants are mating now. So there are some easily observed features of each moon cycle that we can remark upon. Uh, but there's something much, much deeper that's very difficult to speak of in common Western conceptual thought. There's a vast layered web of intimate relationships, transfers of gifts, um, mutual aid, hunting, predation, reproduction, 
mating. And these relationships and their invisibles are old in a way our common language is very ill-equipped to frame to our thought. But they are accessible to our participation should we choose to engage that way. And they are perceptible to aspects of our, our minds and our bodies and perhaps our essence, our, our spirit, in a way that has more in common with dreaming than it does with thought. And this may be in part why um, many indigenous peoples have profoundly developed traditions, not merely amount, around dreaming, as we think of it, the thing that happens at night when we're asleep, um, but something deeper more rich, more diverse, more profound, that partakes of a similar character in awareness and consciousness. And so we might benefit from understanding that the dreaming we have at night is the resurgence and the invitalization and the healing and the reformation of aspects of our humanity with which we are ordinarily not familiar. And one of the reasons why psychedelic drugs are popular in culture is <clears throat> they have the capacity to forcefully shift our awareness and consciousness from its ordinary forms and activities back towards something we might think of as more essential, ancient, lost. Um, and though I, it's not my goal here to denigrate uh, these medicines and these drugs, um, I would say that it's important to be careful uh, and cautious about suddenly forcing our consciousness into another form. Even if it resembles something innate in us that's natural. The conversation around these substances would for me be very complex and nuanced, but I think our modern uh, inclination to sightsee, spectate, is problematical for us and our development and the development of our intelligence and awareness. So long ago, one evening, I was walking during the full moon. And I often notice very small, tiny things. Um, it's not that I only look at the ground while I'm walking, but partly because I do not wish to kill things by accident. <laughs> and it's pretty hard to avoid that as a gigantic monstrosity, which humans are compared to small, very small creatures. Nonetheless, I try to pay some attention and not just because I don't want to do harm, but also because I want to see who, who is around. And this is one of the strange things about English and Western culture. We refer to plants and animals as what's, what is around, which, which inclines us, the connotation is that of an object, right? A manipulable object, a disposable object, something we can ignore, destroy, manipulate, test, experiment on, and so forth. Um, let's see here. Hmm. 
I've been fascinated by science and biology throughout my life. However, once I understood more deeply <clears throat> the processes involved, I became really troubled. Um, by the idea of a knowledge way <clears throat> that saw insufficient moral or ethical necessity in their relationships with living beings. And what I mean is to kill and torment animals and insects and plants and fishes and amphibians and mice and so on um, for the sake of producing what we refer to as scientific knowledge. Which is most often very mechanical, abstract, disembodied and gets employed for purposes I think we might object to if we understood them more deeply. I would, <laughs> many of them. It's not that science is particularly bad. Um, science is an array of methods. Rather, it's again the problem with our tools riding us <laughs> and our strange propensity to keep producing these kinds of tools and these kinds of relationships with our tools. I think we're, we don't have enough respect for this danger. In any case, long ago I was walking in the night, the moon was shining, and I saw on the ground something resembling an earthworm, but it wasn't. It was a newt, the kind of small chocolate brown, worm-like looking thing that you would just think was a worm unless you looked close enough to see its very tiny legs and the fact that it, it has a head and a tail. <clears throat> and I was completely shocked. I thought, oh my goodness, somewhere around here, newts are hiding. And I've never been able to find them but for some reason, on this night, they are out. And so <laughs> I was very surprised Hello. to see a few newts out on the cement in the night. And I realized, ah, it's the full moon. There must be something going on. There's, some, there's a special event happening here right now today where the newts that are ordinarily hidden emerge and they don't merely emerge. For some reason, they can be found on the sidewalks. Not a good place for newts. Uh, and a, a few of them had been crushed by people stepping on them. And so I, I realized, I just had this realization, oh my goodness, it must be that there's one special moon time in the year when the newts emerge here in the city from their hiding places. But it did not occur to me then to record that time and place. And so all that I really knew, you know, later, was there's some full moon where the newts come out to mate. Now, some of these things were presumptions, right? Of course, I never saw them mating. Perhaps they were doing something else. And that's possible, yet it seems unlikely to me because I wasn't merely thinking about what was going on. It was as if the newts themselves, having been somehow sensitive to my fascination with them, my reverence for them, gave me a gift of understanding. Something was transferred to me in this way. 
and that gift became very important for me. Now, of course, it wasn't the first phenological event that I'd ever <coughs> that I'd ever seen. Right? I knew that the bees will make new hives in a certain season. The butterflies will transform in a certain season. You'll find the caterpillars in one season, the chrysalis in another, the butterflies and moths in another. I knew these things. But it, I don't think I'd ever had any experience of these events being tied to the moon. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't until later having been exposed uh, to some degree to the sort of Western mythos around the moon primarily, which is derivative of, of other knowledge systems and stories. It never occurred to me that the living beings might be hitchhiking on the celestial beings and their transformations. And if there's one thing that's staggeringly beautiful and obvious and profound about life is that everything is drafting on each other. Right? Um, it's much easier to accomplish certain imperatives under specific circumstances that support, nurture, protect, catalyze, these the living temporalities of the world. <clears throat> and all of the creatures, they hitchhikes the wrong word. Drafting is a little closer. Um, they take advantage of the transformations in flow, relation, time, temperature. that occur throughout each moon cycle, each solar cycle. And this topic's infinitely deep. Um, you can certainly see humans hitchhiking, drafting on each other's thought, activity, awareness, in a way that we could understand as opportunistic. Birds traveling together magnify their sensing abilities and their resilience in ways that are extremely complex and in ways that involve each of the individuals we might, each of the animals we might see as an individual, but also transforming those individuals by giving them special roles in groups, flocks, schools of fish, so on. So long ago, I saw the newts and I realized this is something very important. And I linked it to the full moon in my mind, but I didn't know which full moon. And so for many years, I think I saw the newts twice in the past 30, 30 years here or so. Um, but I didn't know when. And I expected uh, that it would be one of the moons that we associate with spring, perhaps um, June. But last night, I was walking and talking with one of my dear friends in Israel. And I saw on the ground for the first time in more than, in probably more than 20 years, I saw that one of these newts had been crushed, which meant it had been out. And this was two days after the full moon. And it had been there long enough that I could, I could ascertain it was very likely that this 
full moon in Katoi is the one where the newts emerge from hiding, perhaps to mate and renew the ancient cycle of life and relation they embody. <clears throat> and I was unhappy that the newt was dead, that I found, but I was happy because now I knew in which cycle this happens, which means next time, if I live, I will be able to go out and see them on the full moon in Katoi. I mispronounced it slightly. It's more like Gatoi, Gatoi, something like this. And so that was astonishing. I was so happy to have come full circle, to have learned something of the moon cycles and their unique the unique transformations and relationships that are renewed <clears throat> and re-embodied by the living places over, over the cycle of a year. Now, of course, there are longer cycles. There are cycles that are 10 years long. There are cycles that are 50 years long. There are all kinds of complex synchronizations in organisms over time. I think I remember hearing that, um, I can't remember the exact uh, interval, <clears throat> but some scientists had discovered, <laughs> I often get really worried when I hear this phrase, scientists have discovered something. I'm like, well, that thing will be dead quick. Um, and this is too often the case, right? Uh, when, when it was ascertained that the... Um, <clears throat> bristlecone pines were among the oldest organisms on earth, uh, an arborist or biologist took a core sample, not understanding that the nature of the bristlecone pine is to have a very thin sort of strand of living tree buried within layers and layers of, of uh, material that's no longer actively alive. And in taking a core sample from this tree, he killed it. And this happens over and over again. We find something very old, we kill it. Uh, we discover a new life form, we kill it, and bring it back to the lab for dissection, classification, measurement, and so on. That's a deeply tragic loss for us. Also for the beings who are killed. Uh, obviously, but it's tragic for us because killing is a really shitty way of knowing. And killing simply to gain mechanical understanding might be even worse, um, often is worse. <laughs> So I get very nervous when I hear that scientists have discovered something new about life or life forms, because it's not clear to me at all that that discovery is going to be beneficial for us as, as living beings or for the beings with whom we relate and those, we, those that science uh, turns its awareness towards or scientists turn their awareness towards. And I would say that um, the purposes, there's something wrong with these purposes that produce clinical knowledge. Not that I'm opposed to clinical knowledge or necessarily the methods we use to derive it. <clears throat> but there are vast layers and branches of those methods and domains and many more layers and branches of how that knowledge is eventually applied and for which purposes that I find terrifying and wrong, fundamentally wrong. 
So last night, after discovering the newts, or a newt, <laughs> and realizing the full moon has just passed, completing that 30 year circle. Oh, so I was telling a story. Um, the scientists had discovered a, a patch of microbes in the Arctic that appear to draft on long-term solar cycles so that they might come to life and reproduce. And I, I, again, I can't remember the interval, but let's say once every 300 years or 1,000 years or 5,000 years, they're following intimately transformations in the sun-earth-moon relationship. And I found that so amazing. But this is just an example to illustrate that our temporality um, kind of naturally limits us to scopes that are at least within our lifespan and pay, uh, rhythms that are relatively easily recognizable from our human temporal perspectives. The moon cycle is a very accessible perspective. And I guess it works out to 28 to 29 days, but I'm not sure about that. So, I took a picture of the newt, the crushed newt that I found. Um, not really as a memento, uh, but as a reminder of which day this year that happened on. And of course, we can use various systems together. We can have the a sort of Gregorian system overlaying the, the moon cycle systems. But what's deeply important to me is not these systems, though their capacity to draw us in to deeper and more meaningful relationships with living beings and places is profound. And this is what I find, you know, part of what I find provocative and beautiful. I'm more interested in the invisibles. I'm more interested in hmm, the aspects of knowledge that are not conceptual, not intellectual, not descriptive in the sense of being models or representations, but that are transports, that are doorways, that our interiority under some circumstances is invited into relation with, meaningful, deep relation. And the story of last night continues in a strange and unexpected way. So on part of my walk, there's a very steep hill. <clears throat> and I take this route in part for exercise because there's some good hills and I'm getting on in years. <laughs> um, and as I was ascending the hill, uh, there was a peculiar event. I was still on the phone with my friend in Israel and a rather troubled man across the street began to try to communicate with me. Of course, I had my ear, my ear pods in. And it was clear that, uh, that he was nervous and, and fraught. And he asked me if I might be so kind as to make a phone call for him. Or rather, he asked if he could use my phone. And I explained, well, I'm on the phone, so let me... Let me tell my friend I'll call them back. And I paused the call, branded it. And then he explained his predicament. 
and why he couldn't use his own phone and asked me to make a call for him because people were going to come and take away his belongings uh, in this coming week if, if he didn't receive the protection of an ally. So he wanted me to call and, and I did that for him and you know he was pleased uh, and offered to pay me but I told him that his comfort was more than sufficient mm -hmm. and then you know that little adventure came to a close but as it did because I didn't have my ear pods in and I have walked up the street 50 60 times in the evening as a uh, <laughs> As that adventure drew to a close, I realized that I was hearing something I've never heard in the city. And I've been around it a lot. I'm not saying I know it really well and there are no frogs here, but the lake that surrounds Strawberry Hill had one bullfrog. And I know of the frogs in the little pond, but I've never heard their nocturnal chorus. And the nocturnal chorus of frogs is an incredible thing, an astonishingly beautiful, deep, rich thing, and a doorway to something, if only we could understand how to respectfully and reverently participate in that doorway. It's a doorway to other intelligences in nature and time or so I understand it. And so I was shocked. I was hearing the nocturnal chorus of many, many frogs. And I called my friend back and I said, there are many frogs here. I think I'm gonna go looking for them. Um, come with me, maybe you will hear them. And uh, she could hear them eventually over the mic. Now the situation was quite complex. I was near a schoolyard. The schoolyard had multiple levels. Above that there was a hill. And, as, and when I first went back to, to find the frogs that I remembered hearing, there was no frog sound. There was the ordinary, or the extraordinary really, um, evening chorus of birds, but no frogs. And without, you know, needing to complicate the story, it, it took a while. But I was very concerned that what I might be hearing wasn't frogs at all. It was a machine emitting frog sounds. Because if you go to certain places in Golden Gate Park, you will find machines emitting the sounds of living things, um, recordings. Now, of course, you can usually tell they are recordings because there's a, a regularity to them that's unnatural. So I wandered around for a while and I thought, maybe the school has put in speakers to produce frog sounds so that the children who go there, um, I don't know. I mean, you finish the statement for me. Personally, I despise these recordings and the incessant replacement of nature with representations, machines, pictures, recordings, so on. Um, but after careful exploration, and again, when I first went back, there was no sound, <clears throat> but it started up again. And after I explored for a bit, I found out where the frogs are, and they are definitely frogs, and there must be hundreds of them and there are different kinds of them. Um, so there's a little pool of some kind up on top of the, uh, the hill above the school and that pool is filled with frogs. And isn't it remarkable 
that on the same night that I discovered the newt, I also found the first place I know of around here where there are many frogs. And I was so happy to hear them. <laughs> and they are certainly aware in their own embodied way, probably not in a conceptual way, of the transformations of threat and opportunity that happen in very small intervals within a moon cycle. Each of the animals is like a kind of living time. And by this, I don't mean a clock. I mean a time being. And their relationships form symphonies within symphonies. And these symphonies are not <laughs> our ordinary concepts, ideas, and clinical knowledge are catastrophically insufficient to encompass what this means, what is actually going on in the living music of beings in relation underneath the sun, underneath the moon. And my friend in Israel could hear the frogs. <laughs> and it was really beautiful. Now, of course, if anyone chose to, though I think they'd be missing out if they did, um, they could presume that those two events were, quote-unquote, mere coincidence. And we have these ideas in, in English and in Western cultures around correspondences and synchronicities, but I, I'm very mistrustful of them. I'm mistrustful of the ideas. Um, it doesn't mean I pay them no attention. Uh, I take them with a lot of salt, so to speak. <clears throat> Yet, uh, we have these derivations and frameworks and models and ideas because there is something in our experience from which we derive them. And that something I am very sensitive to. And there was more than a hint of it here last night with the amphibian. The way my friend Ryan presents phonology is shaped in such a way as to be accessible to moderns. And so uh, it will sound a bit like an academic pursuit. if that's the kind of ear we're listening with. But if we listen more closely, we will see that Ryan hints here and there and sometimes directly introduces non-ordinary aspects of traditional Blackfoot knowledge ways. And of course, even when he is pronouncing the Blackfoot names of plants and animals, um, we're getting a gift there of experience with a language vastly older than English. And somehow, in the sounds of that language, 
there's something exquisite, rare in our experience, deeply profound and related to the living layers of intimacy and relation. that have survived the terrible repercussions of colonization and genocide and omnicide. So for me, this is deeply medicinal. Um, And although The surface may look academic to some and involves modern academic ideas and perhaps biology here and there, folds some of that in. Um, Ryan's really good at making a soup that's accessible to modern people while still carrying in its broth the living heartbeat of these peoples, their ancient traditions, their intimacies and understandings, their agreements and treaties with living places, living beings, and the origin of life, the meaningful, purposive, soil and light and water, their marriage, their children, their histories. And frankly, I'm deeply humbled by all these things. Knowing of them does not make me feel smart or important. (laughs) Quite the opposite. I feel the living places and beings and intimacies and relationships, these are true in a way that humans have never made a network like. The news that emerges when we're engaged in relating with the transformations over each moon cycle, should we so choose to become involved in this way, is absolutely trustworthy and it's of a kind never found in language, never found in concepts. It does not exist in models in the same way that a kiss does not exist in models. An embrace does not exist in models. One being giving their life so that another may survive is not a model. It's a, it's a relational transfer in the dimension of being. It's a recognition, not merely of mutual concern, but of mutual embodiment, that our very bodies are the results, our minds are the results of these relations conserved and continued over unimaginable expanses of living time. In this garden that I now walk in, 60 seconds might be more time than humans have ever measured because the humans measure time flatly with machines. (laughs) But living beings are embodied time and all of them have different temporalities that as I've mentioned 
become symphonic together. And so if we look just to the microbes, if we take just one form, the very tiny life, <clears throat> we m would likely find that some, we might establish in description some kind of conversion rate, right? So that, uh, let's say, an hour is approximately commensurate with, to be conservative, a month in the life of an individual bacterium. But in this little garden, there are more bacteria than there have ever been human beings. And so there are trillions, at least, of bacteria all existing together, hitchhiking on each other, supporting each other, opposing each other, colonizing, arising, disappearing, reproducing. And trillions and trillions of months of comparable time happen in one minute in this garden. In the same way that one human year is actually 7.8 billion human years if there are 7.8 billion human beings uniquely participating and experiencing it, participating in it and experiencing it. And from this perspective, time is nothing like our ideas. Um, and in fact, could be understood as a shockingly sophisticated dimension of relationships. I wouldn't throw away flat time, but I don't believe in it. <laughs> it's not real. It's a uh, convenience of description, measurement, modeling. Useful, but deceptive. <clears throat> We've all had experiences where a few hours might seem to last for months or pass in what seems like no time at all. And so even our own temporal experience is in conflict um, with the measured specificity of mechanical time. One of the peculiar skills and abilities of our kind of animal is to produce these sorts of representations. It's unfortunate when they ride us into tragedy, confusion, blindness, loss of sensing, loss of relation, loss of intimacy. And then, of course, when this happens, often these losses are represented right, in photographs, theories, measurements, descriptions, commodities, transactions, and so on. There's a bizarre problem with Western thought, um, and it's not merely Western thought, of course. It's just difficult for me to find a good label or badge for it. Sometimes I just call it modernity, but that's a very uh, inexact word very blurry, very vague. Uh, what does it mean? But I suppose I mean the models of meaning, value, relation, time, identity that we inherit 
and then tend to crystallize as we grow older. And how bereft they are and dismissive of our true nature as living beings and intelligences, as expressions of the entire history of life, not merely on earth, but in all places. For the life on earth must be an expression of the context with which and for which it arises and departs. And this is why you'll often find me uh, taking a critical slant or perspective on what I refer to as uh, formal representational cognition. But of course, that's been a part of our toolbox for a long, long time, evolutionarily, if indeed time is actually linear. Another idea that I doubt. It looks to me like there's something going on where the future is feeding back into the past. And this moment is emerging both from the past and the future and is deeply, profoundly related um, in its expressivity, what it is expressing. Time is among the most mysterious of ideas. And I'm fascinated by, what, by the small <laughs> um, advancements I've been able to make in my thinking around temporality, and life, intelligence, and light, water, space-time. It's beautiful to be able to share the story of the newts. Um, and to, to know that there are still some here and to have discovered a frog colony uh, during this moon cycle, Gatoi, which means approximately uh, we may require some assistance with eating. Um, there's a couple of interpretations Ryan's presented. Uh, in his lectures, and they're all useful. I wouldn't dismiss any of them. Um, but this refers to the great difficulty of obtaining food in the latter part of winter. Many beings are starving. And this presents the opportunity to forge relationships by sharing food and to nurture um, and what is the word I'm seeking here to to celebrate and renew these relationships and our own humanity. For those of you who are interested, I hope you may take some time to listen to some of Ryan's lectures and um, to participate in his missions, perhaps even to support them, for I consider them invaluable and beautiful and noble in their way. I've been watching the ground pass by me as I walk. And now that I've paused and I'm looking at the sky, there's a, there's a photic driving 
phenomenon. Um, this is the capacity to uh, preserve behaviors and situations in our nervous systems. Um, for a short time, uh, usually, um, beyond which they were being in, uh, employed. <clears throat> so when I watch the ground flowing past me for 20 or 30 minutes under my feet, and I then look up to the sky, it appears that the clouds are departing away from me. In a way, not entirely dissimilar to how when one is standing in the surf, uh, one feels pulled backwards as it surges toward us and pulled toward the ocean as it recedes. I find this experience profound. The clouds are not doing what my eyes and my felt senses transmit to me. Instead, because my nervous system was doing, was engaged in this particular form of seeing where the ground is flowing past me, and this also works with water. If you watch one spot on water that's flowing long enough and then you look away, you may see your vision warping and flowing in ways that aren't commonly familiar to us from unintoxicated states, but ways we may have some familiarity with from states of illness, ecstasy, or intoxication. Psychedelics seem to produce various kinds of driving phenomenon like this, or um, <clears throat> one moment. They may also disinhibit uh, features of our nervous systems that are ordinarily engaged in maintaining stability. Um, some of these may be inhibited. Uh, I think others are excited um, or catalyzed. But to have one's vision flowing and changing opens us to the perspective that there are other ways of sensing familiar to our bodies, unfamiliar to our expectations and thinking. And when I see that flowing with my eyes as the clouds recede away, seemingly, I feel something unusual as well. And it's not merely disorientation. It's recognition. It's a memory of another way of having a mind, a way that more resembles our experience while dreaming than it usually does our experience while awake. Perhaps today we have been dreaming together with the living places, the plants and animals and insects, the waters and land and mountains, the deserts, the forests, the rivers, the lakes, the oceans, the islands, the plains, the meadows, the frozen places, the secret places beneath the earth, the secret living places in the sky.
perhaps today, in remembering and speaking of these matters, we've opened a door together. A door familiar to our humanity and our nature as animals and organisms. And often unfamiliar to our common modern habits of thought, description, speech, behavior. I hope this may be the case in a way that is worthy and virtuous. Thank you for joining me. Perhaps soon we may remember together how to participate with the living beings and places in the news that is most trustworthy and true and almost the polar opposite of what we're used to thinking of when we hear the word news. <laughs> I look forward to learning together again soon. Thank you.